Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Father, we thank you and bless your name for bringing us here tonight so you can develop us and give us insight in a deeper, broader, higher way in Jesus' name. We pray that your word will profit everyone. And you lift us up so that we cross every mountain, every challenge, get into the ministry and be fruitful in our ministries in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. Consider we're coming to John chapter 1, reading from verse 29. Tonight we're talking of the blessedness and the eternal blessings of believing the Lamb of God. John chapter 1. Reading from verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold him. Look away from every other personality. Look away from the old and the present. Look away from the prophets. Look away from every religious leader. And behold and look and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the Lamb of God. He comes to take away the sin of the world. In verse 36, in verse 36, it says, and looking upon Jesus, there's no doubt as to the identity. There's no doubt as to the recognition of the one who is the Lamb of God. There are no two lambs of God, just one, unique, universal, and for the whole world. And looking upon Jesus, he as he walks, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Tonight, we talk about the Lamb, the Lamb of God, already revealed in the Old Testament, prophesied about in the Old Testament, and now he came to the world and he showed that this is the Lamb of God. We're looking at the blessedness of that Lamb. And we're looking at the eternal benefits and blessings while we believe on the Lamb of God. The three points we're considering, number one, is the foundation of the provided Lamb of God. Number two, number two is the fullness of the perfect Lamb of God. And number three is the finality by the preeminent Lamb of God. Let's look at number one. Number one is the foundation of the promised and the provided Lamb of God. As we look at Revelation chapter 13, we're reading from verse 8 there, and it says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that's worship the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life. That in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Jesus Christ was not an afterthought. From the very foundation of the world, from the very foundation of the earth, even before the foundation of the earth, he has been known that he will be the lamb that will come and take the sins of the world away. In Revelation chapter 17, reading from verse 14, it tells us, These shall make war with the lamb, 
and it says and the lamb shall overcome them then he tells us for he is lord the lord of lords and the king of kings and were told they that followed him it says they that are with him are called and they are chosen and they are faithful you'll see that the lamb had been identified as the lamb of god even from the very foundation of the world the foundation of the provided lamb of god look at three things here number one is the sacrificial lamb our own substitute he is our substitute is the one that took our place is the one that took our sin is the one that took our punishment upon him and is the one that makes us free from the pain the punishment the perdition we should have experienced he is the sacrificial lamb our substitute number two is the spotless lamb our sacrifice is the one that was sacrificed for us and the children of israel before christ came sacrificed the lambs and the animals now christ has come and he has fulfilled the final sacrifice he has fulfilled the acceptable sacrifice there's no sacrifice anymore by anyone in any community in any religion because he christ the, the spotless lamb has been sacrificed for us number three number three is the smitten lamb our savior smitten for us crucified for us and killed and slain for us the smitten lamb our savior we're looking at number one number one we're looking at the sacrificial lamb who is our substitute you remember genesis chapter 22 when god called abraham and he said he should sacrifice the son unto him and that um, and um, we're told that abraham immediately the following morning early in the morning he rose up he took isaac he was going to sacrifice him unto the lord and uh, look at uh, genesis chapter 22 reading from verse 7 and isaac speak unto abraham his father and said my father and he said here i am my son and he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering i see it was familiar with making sacrifices unto the god of heaven and as they were going of course abraham did not tell isaac what god the father god the almighty had said and what god was going to do and so isaac said are we forgetting something here is the wood here is the fire where is the lamb for the burnt offering for the sacrifice then in verse 8 in verse 8 we're told and abraham said my son god will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering god will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering if you understand that that's prophetic he will provide abraham was not walking by sight he was walking by faith and he knew that god will not um, take his son from him because he had promised him that through isaac all the families of the earth will be blessed all the families of the earth will come to the blessing of salvation and blessing of reconciliation with god and blessing of redemption and so he believed that even if he slew the son even if he killed the son in obedience to the word of god god will raise him up that's why he said god will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering 
he will himself will provide but then he will provide himself because he's going to give us deity is going to give us the lamp of God Jesus Christ his only begotten son who is God from all eternity he'll provide himself a lamb for a bunch offering and so both of them went together look at the fulfillment in Romans chapter 5 we're reading from verse 8 in Romans chapter 5 reading from verse 8 but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners God died for us for us he died for us as a substitute we should have died the soul that sinneth it shall die but the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ and now God has commended his love his saving love his eternal love he has commended that love towards us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us it tells us in verse 9 in verse 9 it says much more than being now justified by his blood we cannot be justified any other way we cannot be saved any other way we're justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath through him the wrath we inherited and the wrath were brought upon ourselves because of our sin because of our unrighteousness now christ has borne that and because he has borne that as our substitute we're now free then in verse 10 verse 10 says for if when we were enemies we were no more enemies we were in the past now we're reconciled now we're forgiven. Now we're turned around. Our lives are transformed. And because now we do not have that condemnation we used to have because we have believed in him. It says now that we are reconciled to God by the death of his son, a substitute. The one who died for us. The one who died in our place much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life verse 11 in verse 11 it says and uh, not only so but we also joy in god because we are now saved through our lord jesus christ by whom we have now received the atonement and let's go to first thessalonians chapter 5 reading there from verse 9 it says for god has not appointed us to wrath god has not appointed us to wrath having given his only begotten son as a substitute he died for us to take away a condemnation a punishment an eternal doom and damnation now god has not appointed those who are saved those who are born again those who have put their faith in christ he has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our lord jesus christ we're looking at number two now number two we're looking at the spotless lamb our sacrifice in exodus chapter 12 when the children of israel were to come out of egypt and they were to begin their journey going to the promised land picturing us now coming out of the world coming out of sin coming off out of all our evil of the past and we're on our way to heaven the promised land for us the paradise what they did is what we've done because they were told to take a lamb a lamb without blemish exodus chapter 12 we're looking at verse 3 it tells us in verse 3 it says speak him unto the congregation of israel saying the saying in the uh, 12 in the 10th day of this month that they shall take 
to them to themselves every man a lamb every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for an house and then he tells us in verse 4 in verse 4 he affirms that if the house and if the household be too little be too small or that for the for the lamb it says let him the head of that home let him the the husband there and the head let him and his neighbor next unto his house make according to the uh, number thereof number of the souls and it says every man according to his uh, to, according to his eating shall he shall you uh, shall shall you count for the lamb then in verse 5 in verse 5 it says your lamb shall be without blemish your lamb shall be spotless your lamb shall be blameless there shall be no blame no spot and it says your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year ye shall make it out from the sheep or from the goats the point is that if any sacrifice was going to be acceptable unto the Lord, it must be without spot, it must be without blame, it must be without blemish, because it, that lamb was standing in for Christ. Christ that will become our Savior. Christ that will come to take all our sins away. For that sacrifice to be acceptable to heaven, it must be spotless. And God said, when I see the blood, the blood of that spotless, blameless lamb, I will pass over you. And let's come to the New Testament and see the fulfillment of that in Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed, ye were not reconciled, ye were not saved with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, from your vain lifestyle, from your sinful lifestyle. But it says now, we receive by uh, all those things we did, we received from, by tradition from uh, our fathers. Look at verse 19. Uh, it talks about Christ now. His life blameless, his life spotless, his life pure, his life perfect, because only such a lamb, only such a sacrifice can be acceptable in the sight of God in verse 19. Uh, but of the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, a lamb, a lamb. This is the lamb, spotless, giving for our sin, without blemish and without spot. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading there from verse 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says very clearly, it tells us here, and it says, purge out therefore the old leaven. Purge out therefore the old lifestyle, the old sinful life, and the old abominable things that we used to do. It says that ye may be a new lamb. Uh, that's the essence of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if I say, if you say, if anybody says, I am a tasted of that sacrifice, a partaking of the benefit of that sacrifice, and the old life is still there, that will be self-deception. That will be a person saying, I am washed, but I'm still dirty. 
I'm cleansed, but I'm still filthy. I am set free, but I'm still bound. That will be contradiction in terms. The spotless lamb of God was given for us as a sacrifice so that we will no more be of the old life. It said that ye may be a new lamb, a new lamb, as ye are unleavened for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The lamb sacrificed for us. That's how he takes our sins away. Behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The reason he takes them away is that he has given a sacrifice. And that sacrifice had been acceptable unto the Lord. In verse 8, in verse 8, he tells us then, he says, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, old lifestyle, old abominations, old sinfulness, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice, of hatred, of wickedness, but with the unleavened bread, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's come to number three there. Number three is the smitten lamb, our Savior. The smitten lamb, our Savior. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, reading there from verse 4, it says very clearly, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He took away our pain. He took away our sorrow. He took away what will have grieved us for all eternity. And then he says, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. The smiting that should have come upon our lives. The sorrows that should have come upon our lives. The eternal judgment that should have come upon our lives. Everything was laid on Christ. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He did no sin. He did no evil for the sin we had committed, for the evil we had done. That's why he was meeting. That's why he was bruised. And then we were told he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. In verse 6, it says, All we like sheep. I've gone astray, all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. We couldn't be in the presence of God. We couldn't enjoy the presence of God in our sin, because as oil and water do not mix, the holy God and sinful man will not be together. But because he now everything we had done had been laid on him. That's how we can now have fellowship with God in the presence of the Almighty God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone, every man, every woman, every creature on earth. We have gone everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And look at verse 7. In verse 7, he now tells us, it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb. He, Christ, as Elam, they're still prophetic. The prophet was looking ahead to the time when Christ will come. And he already identified him. And he said, it's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and uh, as sheep before her shearers. And is dumb, 
so he openeth not his mouth. And look at First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 23. First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. They said, come down from the cross and we will believe you. Ah, that's the one that said he'll build the temple in three days. Let him come down now. Then we will know he is the real lamb of God. But he wasn't to open his mouth. Oppressed and punished and derided. But he will not respond because he was fulfilling the prophecy. He says, who oh, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. Verse 24. In verse 24, he now says, who oh, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins that's what he does and that the salvation of the lord is not to make us still active in sinning alive in sinfulness and still going on in the same old way we have ever done in our sins no is to make us dead to our sins all our sins not just some of the sins it makes us dead unto them that we do not respond to those temptations to sinfulness anymore just like a dead man will not respond to abuse to men's anger and to men's uh, uh, jesting or whatever is dead if he responds is not dead the same thing with us christ made the sacrifice we turned away from sin and believe on the lord jesus christ our savior temptation will come trials will come but we are dead to sin we're dead to the world we're dead to the devil that's why we don't respond anymore that we should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed we're coming to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at the fullness of the perfect Lamb of God. If the provided Lamb of God from the Old Testament period, even until he came to fulfill the prophecy, but now he has come. And after he came, he lived a perfect life. In thought, he was perfect. In action, he was perfect. In fulfilling the word of God, it was perfect. In obeying the heavenly father, doing everything the heavenly father had outlined he should do, he was perfect. In accepting to offer himself to death so that he can pay for our salvation, he was perfect. And in everything that he did in fulfilling the word of God, reaching before him, he was perfect. This is the perfect Lamb of God. And through that, he's giving us the fullness, the fullness of grace. He has given us the fullness, the fullness of godliness. He has given us the fullness, the fullness that we're going to have as we go to glory. The, glo uh, the fullness of all the provision of Calvary, the fullness of everything that he had provided, we can now have because the lamp of God, perfect lamp of God, has offered a perfect sacrifice unto the heavenly father and we're looking at john chapter one we're reading here from verse 16 it says and of his fullness have we all received grace for grace then tells us in verse 17 in verse 17 for the law came for the law was given by moses but grace and truth in their fullness came 
by Jesus Christ. We're looking at uh, three things here. Three things. Number one, uh, we're looking at the saving lamb, our sufficiency. Number two, the sanctifying lamb, our sanctifier. And number three, is the supernatural lamb, our shepherd. Look at number one there. Number one is the saving lamb our sufficiency isn't that what john chapter 1 verse 29 emphasized look at that again in john chapter 1 verse 29 the next day john sees jesus coming unto him and says behold the lamb of god we take it away take it away take it away the sin of the world is done the global sacrifice is done the sacrifice that is effective efficacious from generation to generation for the whole world everyone now has to come every now everyone now has to come and believe believe to the point that we know that sin will ruin us sin will destroy us sin will damn our soul and so we come to the Lord in all sincerity and we confess all the sins that we know and we bundle them together and transfer them to the Lord Jesus Christ who has come to take away all those sins and we ask him for grace and we ask him for the strength and we ask him for the steadfastness to resist all those sins if any of them will try to come back because we depend on Christ and we live and lean on Christ we know all those sins he has taken away they will not come back in Jesus' name. And look at uh, and look at First John chapter three verse four. It says in First John chapter three verse four, whosoever committed sin also transgresses the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And what that is sin is God draws the line, and it says. This is our boundary. This is the circle in which we live. We live righteously. And we live purely on the basis of the commandments of God. If we go beyond the line, we transgress. We trespass. Because now we've gone beyond the line that God set for our righteousness. And he's telling us sin is the trespassing, is the transgression of the law. Now about Christ, we're told in verse 5. In verse 5, it says, and we know that he, Christ, he, the Lamb, he, the perfect Lamb of God, he was, he was manifested to take away our sins. That's what he came to do. And anyone, church man, church woman, anyone that uh, still practices sin, common sin, secret sin, besetting sin, and uncommon sin, peculiar sin, anyone that is still practicing in sin is not making use of all that Christ has done because Christ came to take away our sins and in him look at his life in him look at his words in him look at his action in him look at his interaction with anyone and everyone in him is no sin look at verse 6 in verse 6 it says whosoever whosoever abideth in him sinneth not Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. When you picture that here you are, a believer, a child of God, here is Christ, and you see him, and he sees you, and temptation comes, you will not commit sin while you abide in his presence, while you abide in his grace, 
what you abide under his view is looking at you and he knows your heart he knows your thoughts he knows your action he knows your plan he knows everything whosoever then abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth has not seen him neither known him look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous verse 8 in verse 8 he that committeth sin secretly or openly he that committeth sin having pleasure in sin and drinking and eating and touching and deriving some benefit in sinfulness he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this cause for this purpose for this reason the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil look at verse 9 in verse 9 whosoever is born of god does not commit sin for the seed remaineth in him the seed of christ the seed the result of his sacrifice his seed remaineth in him and he cannot will not sin because he is born of god in verse 10 it tells us in verse 10 in this if they are the children of god manifested and the children of the devil whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of god he neither he that loveth not his brother hebrews chapter 7 reading from verse 25 hebrews 7 reading from verse 25 wherefore he is able there's no weakness in him he is able there's no deficiency in his sacrifice wherefore he is able and there is none else that can do what he has done is completed everything for salvation wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Then he says, seeing he ever needed to make intercession for them. In verse 26, it says in verse 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, on the field, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens look at number two there number two is the sanctifying lamb our sanctifier he gave himself for us he sacrificed himself he shed his blood his blood was shed so that he will not only save us and forgive the external sins but that he will also get into our heart into our spirit into our very nature and purge out the depravity and the sin there it tells us in ephesians chapter 5 look at the latter part of verse 25 we're told that christ also loved the church that he gave himself for the church christ loved the church yes he loved the world and sacrificed for the salvation of the world but now after we're saved and we become part of the church 
he lodged the church and gave himself for it. In verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse the church. Every individual, every member, every individual believer in the church cleanse it of the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, in verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, a church where the depravity is um, preeminent, that's not a glorious church. A church where small, small sins, common sins, besetting sins are given allowance to keep on being manifested. That's not a glorious church. A church that will excuse any form of sin in their personal lives and private lives. That's not a glorious church. Christ, the sanctifying lamb, he sacrificed himself, he gave himself so that he will purge us from everything that he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy, it should be holy, not just on paper, it should be holy, not just in doctrine, it should be holy, not just by empty testimony, empty profession, should be holy through and through in the heart, in the mind, in the thought, in our private lives, in our public lives, in our commercial life. Everything, everywhere we go, that the church, all the members of the church should be holy and without blemish. Titus chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that's Christ. For us believers, for us the real children of God, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, internal iniquity, external iniquity, the iniquity of society the iniquity of the nation, the iniquity of things the uh, people of the world do, and they cover it up, and sometimes it takes 20 years for those things to come out. Sometimes it takes 30 years for those things to come out. But while the people of the world are in office, and while they are supervising everything, all the iniquity can be covered, and there are people even in the church that they do iniquity, they get into transgression, and everything is covered up. Unfortunately, it's after they die, the people are bold enough to say, actually, I know that you know, everybody in the church is thinking that you know, so-and-so has got, gone to heaven, so-and-so has gone to heaven, but really, really, what I know about him and what we know about her these days and days are not bold enough when he was alive when she was alive to bring out all those dirty dirty things that were doing in secret but christ has come so that he will not only pardon us he will purge us he will purify us and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12, it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, that he might purify the people with his own blood, is suffered without the gauge. And if we appreciate his suffering, will go to him 
for that sanctification. If we believe in his suffering, the necessity of his suffering for us, for you and for me, then we'll not just shove it aside. We'll go to him and let him do the work in us that he has sacrificed for. In verse 13, verse 13 says, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Why? Verse 14. In verse 14, for here have we no continuing city. This one is temporary, but the eternal place we're going, we should be forever and forever and ever we demand holiness before we can get there. We demand sanctification before we can get there. We demand be purified and purged and preserved in that perfection before we can get there. It says, for our, for we have here no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We're looking at number three here. Number three is the supernatural lamb, our shepherd. The supernatural lamb, our shepherd. It tells us in Revelation chapter 5, verse 4. Revelation chapter 5, verse 4. It says, And I wept, this John the beloved, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book neither to look thereon in verse 5 verse 5 says and one of the elders this is in heaven says unto me weep not behold behold he the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed, and to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. It tells us in verse 6, in verse 6 it says, And I beheld, and lo, in the, in the, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, the bees, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, capital L, a lamb. This is Christ, the only one qualified to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. And I beheld that lamb as it had been slain having seven hands means total power complete supernatural power and seven eyes knowledge revelation inside sight and inside it says which are the seven spirits the fullness of the spirit of god in christ sent forth into all the earth and then we're told in verse 7. In verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the hand of him that seated, up, that sat upon the throne. Verse 13. In verse 13, we're told, And every creature which is in heaven, every creature also on the earth and under the earth and it says such as are in the sea and all that are in, in them had I seen blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb, unto the Lamb, unto the Lamb forever and ever. That is the Lamb, the supernatural Lamb that can do what only He could do 
and no other man and no angel can do what he has done to be able to take that book from the hand of the almighty God. He is the supernatural lamb, our shepherd. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 20. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, Christ, the shepherd of the sheep. It says, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, verse 21, verse 21 then tells us, make you perfect. That's the promise of God. That's the provision of Christ, that he has provided the means for us to be pardoned, to be purified, and to be perfect. If we are imperfect, if we are falling and rising, it's because we are not making use of the provision of Christ, the great Savior, the great Sanctifier, and the great Shepherd. But when we make use of the provision He has given, make you perfect in every good work in every good work oh because i have a lot to do i do this i do this that's why i'm imperfect because i cannot concentrate on just one thing just one good work that's why i'm imperfect no it says he'll make you perfect in every good work to do his will and then he says walking in you that which is well pleasing when he comes into our lives and he does everything that we should allow him to do in our lives, he makes us to fulfill the will of God, doing that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to him, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Another good amen. amen. Let's come to point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at the finality by the preeminent Lamb of God. The finality by the preeminent Lamb of God. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 17, it says, And he is before all things, he, Christ, He the Lord, He the Lamb of God, is before all things, and uh, by Him all things consist, all things exist, all things continue. It's a sustaining power that makes all things on earth, all things visible, all things invisible, to subsist, to exist. And to continue, look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the originator, and the first born from the dead, the one that rose up from the dead and never died again. And after the resurrection, he went in ascension to heaven. And then he tells us that in all things, he might have the preeminence. In all things, all things in heaven, all things on earth, all things natural, all things supernatural, all things relating to our salvation, all things relating to our sanctification, all things relating to the strength of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in all things, all things visible and invisible, that Christ, the Lamb of God, might have the preeminence, verse 19, in verse 19, for it pleased the Father, 
that in him should all fullness dwell. It has pleased the Father that in Christ, in this preeminent Lamb of God, all things in its fullness should dwell. In verse 20, verse 20 tells us and says, And having made peace, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. That's the preeminence of the Lamb of God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the sovereign Lamb the supreme, sovereign, kingly, royal, is supreme. Number two, is the submissive lamb, his servant. Even though he's so high, even though he's sovereign, even though he's king of kings and lord of lords, yet he surrendered himself. He submitted himself unto the heavenly father, the submissive lamb, that is servant number three. Number three is the sinless lamb in supremacy. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the sovereign lamb, the supreme. It tells us in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. These shall make war of the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and it says they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. He is supreme. He has sovereignty. He is Lord of Lords. And is king of kings. And those who have any association with him, those who have any intimacy with him, those who belong to him, they are called out of sin, out of the world, out of the works of the devil. They are called, they are chosen. Many are called, but because they are not willing to abide by the calling. They are not chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Those who are chosen, they are chosen because of reconciliation. They are chosen because of their redemption. They are chosen because they are righteous in the Lord. And they are faithful. Children of God. Ministers of God. Servants of God. They are with Christ. They are with the Lamb. They are with the Sovereign One. And they are faithful. They are faithful in their personal lives. They are faithful in their pri private lives. They are faithful in their public lives. They are faithful in their professional lives. They are faithful in their ministerial lives as well. King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 1. We're reading from verse and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the, the begotten of the dead and then we're told he is the prince of the kings of the earth the prince the esteemed one the great one, the highest over the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us from and saved us and washed us from our sins by his own blood. Then in verse 6, in verse 6, and he has made us kings and is still our king king of kings. He's made us priests and he's still our high priest over all of us who are priests unto God 
and his father to him be glory to him be glory and dominion forever and ever him revelation chapter 19 we're reading from verse 16 revelation 19 verse 16 and he has on his vesture and on his tie a name written king of kings and lord of lords is supreme number two number two this is the submissive lamb the servant of god in philippians chapter 2 verse 5 philippians chapter 2 verse 5 uh, let this might be in you which was also in christ jesus verse 6 in verse 6 who oh, being uh, in the form of god god himself he thought it not robbery to be equal with god i and my father are one yet look at verse 7 in verse 7 but he made himself of no reputation remember let this mind be in you we're not running after reputation we're not running after self-esteem. We're not running after the promotion of the world and the promotion by the world. Let the mind of Christ be in you, supreme yet submissive. And he submitted himself to becoming the servant of God. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of of a servant he said i am among you a seed that serveth and he says we shall not be lords over god's heritage beating them down oppressing them pushing them up trampling on them he said the people of the world they do that but he said in the kingdom of god and in the church of the lamb in the church of the living god it should not be so among us it says he himself even though he was in the form of god yet he thought it not trouble to be equal with god and he took upon himself the form of a servant and it was made in the likeness of men verse 8 and being found in the in fashion as a man he humbled himself when last did you humble yourself having the mind of christ when last did you resist lording over anyone in the household of faith when last were you lowly and meek like the lord jesus christ when last did you realize that you have to follow after the footsteps of Christ? He made himself a servant and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto, unto death, even the death of the cross. And he tells us in his word, we should look up to him and be like him. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, not looking unto yourself, to pump up yourself, to puff off yourself, to exalt yourself. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross did not curse did not threaten did not do anything that will oppress anybody and say they merit it look at what they have done to me and so i should do this to them even in his high divine position we're told he was rejoicing because of what was said before him and he endured the cross. 
despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Isaiah chapter 52, reading from verse 13. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold my servant, supreme, my servant, sovereign, my servant, exalted, my servant. He says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, wisely. He shall be exalted and extolled and very high. Number three now. Number three, the sinless lamb in supremacy. Sinless, spotless, separate from sinners, in supremacy and that's what he wants to make of us he wants to so walk in our heart as we behold him as we believe him as we beseech him and ask that what he came to do on earth as the lamb of god to take away the sins of the world that he will do that for us fully completely wholeheartedly in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Able, able to save, able to forgive, able to set free from sin, able to purge, able to purify, able to sanctify, able to take us away from sin and able to take sin away from us able to save us today able to save us this week and this month and this year able to save us to the uttermost to the end of the world able to separate us completely from sin every day every moment all our lives wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. We have to come through him. We have to come by him. And it's only what he has done on the cross of Calvary that can purge and purify and make us ready for heaven. Seeing he ever needed to make intercession for them. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, for such an high priest befitted us, became us, who is holy. He is holy, is able to make us holy, harmless, is able to make us harmless too, undefiled, and is able to make us undefiled, separate from sinners, is able to keep us separate from the world and separate from all the defilement and all the things of the world and made higher than the heavens. We're coming to Revelation chapter 11, reading from verse 15. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 2, we're looking at it from verse 1. In Psalm 2, it's still telling us about the supremacy of Christ, the sovereignty of Christ, the royalty of Christ, the exalted position of Christ. And he's gone now to prepare a place for us. And when he's finished, he will come and he'll take us home to be with himself in Jesus' name. Look at it, Psalm 2 verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people of this earth imagine a vain thing, verse 2. 
He says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers of this world, they make counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Saying, verse 3, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4, in verse 4 it says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh and laugh at them. The Lord shall have them in derision. Verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his so displeasure. Verse 6. Yet have I said my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Do they rage? Do they hate? Do they speak against heaven? So they, don't they propose, let's break the courts asunder. God still said, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Then in verse 8, verse 8, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. The heathen will become the possession of the Lord. And the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Verse 9, And thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Verse 10, In verse 10, be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, the high, the highly placed, the popular, the preeminent in this world, the wise. Christ is the only Savior. Give your heart to him now. Give your life completely. Surrender your life unto him completely because that is the only way to escape the wrath to come and he says in verse 11 serve the lord with fear and rejoice with trembling serve the lord you are called to serve the lord you have the privilege of serving the lord have the filial fear don't take his work into your hand and just do it any way you like. Are you a pastor? Are you a preacher? Are you a minister? Are you a shepherd? Are you an evangelist? Are you a teacher of the word? Serve the Lord with reverential fear, filial fear, and rejoice. Rejoice in the privilege. Rejoice in the opportunity. But rejoice with trembling. Don't forget yourself. And this and that, thank God, but rejoice with trembling. Then in verse 12, it says, Kiss the Son, befriend the Son, love the Son of God above everything, anything here in this world. Love Him with all your heart, lest He be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You put your trust in him, you are blessed in Jesus' name. You trust him as Savior. You trust him as your substitute. You trust him as the acceptable sacrifice. You trust him as your sanctifier. 
you trust him as your shepherd you trust him as the sovereign one you trust him as the servant of god who has come to fulfill his will here on earth you trust him and you love him and honor him because he has submitted himself though in supremacy love him believe him trust him trust in him and you do that till the end of your life heaven will be your destiny in jesus name Amen. let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer recollect everything we've learned behold the lamb of god the saving lamb of god the sanctifying lamb of god behold the lamb of god he came to take away our sin and when he takes that sin away the sin will no longer be there whosoever is born of god does not continue committing sin for his seed remaineth in him and he will not sin he cannot sin because is born of God. Whosoever is born of God keepeth himself and will not sin. And the wicked one will not touch him. Tell the Lord, open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Let the benefit of what you have heard today penetrate your heart penetrate your life are you born again do you remember the day you committed your life to the Lord you repented of what of sin those sins should not be allowed to come back. It gives us grace to liberate us from the sins he had forgiven. He came to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. No private sin, no public sin, no sinning with impunity. He came to take away our sin. If we accommodate those sins he came to set us free from will make his sacrifice rubbish will trample on the blood that saved us meditate on the word and pray that God will grant you the grace to live as people whose sins have been taken away. the provided Lamb of God, our substitute. The punishment we should have borne, he bore the punishment. The pain, the perdition we should have inherited and live in all eternity. In perdition, 
in pain, on a punishment, he, our substitute, took that away. Thank him for that. Receive it your heart, it your life. The victory he purchased at Calvary. A substitute, our sacrifice. Christ, the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb, sacrifice for us. Come to Him in all sincerity. No more malice, hatred, wickedness, or righteousness. Christ has been sacrificed for us. Substitute, sacrifice, he is our Savior. He saves from sin. He saves from habitual sin. That's the essence of the Lamb of God taking away our sins. And is able to save through and through. Able to save to the uttermost all who truly come to God by Him. He is holy. He makes us holy without pretense. He is harmless. It makes us harmless, transparently, nothing hidden. It's separate from sinners, it keeps us separate from sin, from sinners, from sinfulness. made higher than the heavens. He lifts us up higher than where we had been. Higher than our human weaknesses. Higher. Higher than what? Superficial life we have been living before. Substitute. Sacrifice. Savior. He is the sanctifying lamb. Can reach deep into our disposition, deep into our native depravity, and cleanse, and purge, and purify. Makes us peculiar. He redeems from all iniquity. He grants us peace in our heart, the peace of God that passes all understanding. 
and it grants us that heart holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He gave himself for us that he might sanctify us and cleanse us by the washing of the word. It's not the sacrifice. What are you making of the sacrifice? How are you benefiting from the sacrifice he made? He gave himself so that he'll purge and present unto himself a glorious church. A church without blemish, believers without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing, but that you and I and everyone on their way to heaven will be holy and without blemish. Is able. Let him do it. He suffered without the gate. Provision, total provision, full provision has been given. Let us now go to him outside the gate bearing his reproach. Persecution may come, bear that. Make sure you have, you possess, you retain that sanctification and holiness of heart, bearing his reproach, opposition might come, persecution might come, contradictions of sinners might come, bearing his reproach. Don't allow the world to take the holiness, the sanctification away from you. For here we have no continuing city, but we we'll seek one to come. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Hearing the word is good. Obeying the word is the real thing. Possessing the blessedness and the blessing of the sovereign lamb that the real thing be fully surrendered unto him absolutely surrendered unto him, continually, faithfully, submissive unto him. Please continue the prayer until you know the real possessor of scriptural biblical salvation, real possessor 
of scriptural holiness and sanctification. As you get back home, don't talk the message away. Secure everything you need to get to heaven. Remember, God is no respecter of persons. He's done everything he should do by sending his only begotten son into the world to pay the price, to provide the experience, to retain the fullness of the grace of God. That will give us the strength, the grace to continue steadfastly in our fellowship, faithfulness, faith in Him. Father, we thank you tonight and bless your name. Thank you for what you have learned concerning your only begotten Son, the acceptable sacrifice the substitute, a savior, and sanctifier, the supreme one. We pray, Lord, all the benefits of Calvary and the blessings of the cross will come to everyone, abide with every one of us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, we'll not just hear, we will believe, we will possess, we will proclaim, and as you make us saved, sanctified, holy, and following after you, grant us the grace to be faithful to your word and to proclaim this same word to all that hear us so that everything you've done for us, you do for them in Jesus' name. And all the people that hear us and believe the word and have the same experience will assess preaching to them and they believe in the word will have the same saving grace, the same sanctifying grace, and the same sufficient grace and will abide until you come in Jesus' name. So that as you come to take your saints away. We will not be left behind in Jesus' name. Help us to possess and preserve that peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Help us to possess and preserve it until the very end. And help us in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of persecution, to continue preaching this word earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints that when you come you'll find faith in us you'll find faithfulness in us and none of us will miss the benefit of going to heaven with you when our time comes thank you lord for the answer in jesus mighty name we pray Amen.